Well, good morning, nine o'clock. How are you guys this morning? Awesome, awesome. This section is doing really good. This section, not so good. Yeah, this section's like, nah. Hey, uh, if you have a Bible, I hope you do. John chapter three is where we will be this morning. John chapter three, you can turn there. Um, some of you guys know this, but uh, I just wanna remind you for two reasons. Um, number one, so you know, but number two, to let you know the cavalry is on its way. We are moving to three services on March 19th. And for those of you who are like, who are all these people? I'm having to like sit in people's laps, which if you're watching live stream, that's not really happening, but I'm just saying. <laughs> um, hey, it is a little tight here. And so uh, if, if you do have seats near you that are open and you wanna scoot in so to make room for that, um, that'd be great. But uh, just know that, hey, it's not gonna be this way forever. We are uh, working on kind of coming up with some solutions for this. And so March 19th, which is coming up, about a month from now, we're gonna be moving to three Sunday morning services. That is gonna be at eight, 10, and 12, all right? And if in between now and then, it's too tight for you on a Sunday morning, just remember, we have Saturday night services and you can come hang out with us then, all right? Um, we also, in order to uh, have new services, we, we need to have different volunteers that step up and um, help us out with that. So if you're currently not serving somewhere and you're interested in serving, um, talk to one of us. We would love to connect you with a serving team to uh, help staff those services. And uh, we have a meeting March 5th about that. You heard Jalen talk about that earlier. And, uh, and I'm just excited. Isn't this cool? And what's cool is, man, it's not just butts and seats. Like, God's doing something cool. We had two people get baptized last night. And uh, that's super cool. That's like, um, if you don't know this, we have baptism services three times a year. But like, we've had like five baptisms in a month just in between baptism services. People are just... They're getting saved and they're coming to know Jesus. And um, that's amazing. And we just praise God for that. And so, um, yeah, so it's a small price to pay if you're a little cramped in your seat to know that people are hearing the gospel and coming to know the Lord. So, um, man, just excited what God's doing. If you haven't been with us, we've been in John's gospel since uh, the beginning of the year. And we're now in John chapter three. We have read about Jesus turning water into wine and Jesus cleansing the temple and Jesus met with a religious leader named Nicodemus and began to speak with Nicodemus about this thing called the new birth. He says to Nicodemus, I tell you, that unless someone is born again, he can never see the kingdom of heaven. And so we talked about what that means and what that looks like. And Nicodemus is perplexed and confused, but Jesus says it. It's like when the children of Israel lifted up their eyes and saw the serpent that Moses lifted up. And we talked about how that was just a picture pointing us to the reality that we are to look to Jesus. And when we look to Jesus and put faith in him, we will be saved. And so we're gonna get into the second half of chapter three this morning. And we're gonna see John the Baptizer and John the Baptizer's disciples discussing with other people the work and the ministry of Jesus. And we see John the Baptizer's response to the identity of Jesus. And we're gonna see that every one of us, we must have a response to who Jesus is. And like, maybe you're on the fence this morning, you're kinda like, well, I don't know, should I respond? You know that like not doing something actually is a response, right? You choosing to be indifferent and apathetic is by default you being someone who has rejected Jesus. And so we're gonna see that our response matters and the heart cry of every true disciple of Jesus is given to us in verse 30 where John the baptizer says, he must increase, but I must decrease. That's the whole point of the Christian life, that we get really small so that Jesus can get really big, amen? So if you have a Bible, I hope you do. We're gonna dive into this together. But before we do, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for what you're doing here. This is very unique and very special and very exciting and amazing. But Lord, we, we don't wanna mess it up by putting our flesh in it. We, we don't wanna mess it up by making it about the experience or making it about us. Lord, you are the centerpiece of everything that we wanna do, Lord. It's your name and your name alone. Jesus above all, over all. Lord, teach us what it means to decrease so that you may increase. And this morning, Father, no matter what we came in here with, no matter what obstacles or challenges or difficulties or anything going on in our life, Lord, we want to hear the truth from your word and to be forever changed. And so, Lord, if we have never read this passage before in all of our lives, or Lord, we have read it so often we have it memorized 
we pray that this morning you would speak something new to our hearts. And may we simply have the humility and the courage and the obedience to receive it from you and to make a response to what it is your word would call us to do. We pray for every church in Cannon County, Tennessee. Lord, we thank you for the wonderful churches in our community having service this morning. Would you bless them, Lord? Would you help us to be united under one name, the name Jesus? And we pray that it is not about one particular brand or tribe or name, but it is one name lifted up over all, and that is the name Jesus. And it's in his name we pray all these things, in Jesus' name, amen. John chapter three, starting in verse 22, we'll read from verse 22 to verse 30. This is God's word. After this, Jesus and his disciples went to the Judean countryside where he spent time with them and baptized. John also was baptizing in Anon near Selim because there was plenty of water there. People were coming and being baptized since John had not yet been thrown into prison. Spoiler alert. Um, <laughs> then a dispute arose between John's disciples and a Jew about purification. So they came to John and told him, Rabbi, the one you testified about and who was with you across the Jordan is baptizing and everyone is going to him. John responded, no one can receive anything unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Messiah, but I've been sent ahead of him. He who has the bride is the groom, but the groom's friend who stands by and listens for him rejoices greatly at the groom's voice. So this joy of mine is complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. So John tells us after these things, that is the meeting of Jesus and Nicodemus at night, Jesus went with his disciples to the Judean countryside. The emphasis of John's gospel will be on the life and ministry of Jesus in this region called Judea, which is in the southern part of Israel. Other gospels tend to focus more on what Jesus did in the region of Galilee, but John, for whatever reason, focuses more on what Jesus did in Judea. John also tells us that John the baptizer was further north in the region of Anon and Salim. That's probably close to uh, the region of Samaria. I don't know if you can see this on the TV screen, but uh, this little peach part down here would be the region of Judea. And this is where Jesus was with his disciples in the first uh, passage we read. And then over here in the purple, kind of near Samaria, we have uh, Salim and Anon. And it says that uh, they were close to water, so they did much baptizing. I mean, what else is he gonna do? He's John the baptizer, there's water. He's like, I gotta do it, right? There's water, let's do it, right? So there's the Jordan River right there, and uh, that's where John the baptizer was during that time. So what was Jesus doing in the Judean countryside? Well, I love what John tells us. He was spending time with his disciples. Or if you have the King James Bible, he tarried there with them. <laughs> well, what does that mean? Well he was just spending time focusing on traveling and eating and talking and just doing life together with these 12. Remember, Jesus would ascend into heaven and pass on the Christian movement to these 12 men. And so, so much of his earthly ministry was focused on investing in these guys so that they would be prepared and ready to continue doing this work when Jesus was in heaven. You know, too often, um, we think that spiritual growth happens through us gaining information. If I can just learn enough Bible verses or just read enough books by old dead theologians, then I'll grow spiritually. But you know how it happens most often? To the context of relationship. And this is what we read about in the Gospels. This is what we read about through the, the New Testament that Paul invested in men like Timothy and, and like Titus and all these other young men. And, and so here's what that tells us, man. Our relationships matter. Have you spent time with Jesus this week? Because you know how you're gonna grow spiritually? Spending time with Jesus. Some of us think that reading about Jesus is enough, but reading about someone is not the same as you spending time with them, right? And so your relationship with Jesus matters. How do you wanna grow in your faith? Well, spend time with them. Also, your relationship with other people matter. That we grow spiritually when we surround ourselves by other believers who want to follow Jesus and who can hold us accountable and encourage us and pick us up and pray for us. And this is why it's so important for you to be in a life group, right? For us to have that kind of community because relationships matter. So John also tells us that people were baptized 
through the ministry of Jesus. Now, here's what's interesting. He's gonna say in the next chapter, verse two, that Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were. But he tells us in chapter 22 that Jesus was baptizing, that later he goes, well, it was not really Jesus, it was his disciples. So who was doing the work, Jesus or his disciples? You know what the answer is? Yes. Like, um, when Jesus does work in the world now, it's him doing the work, but he uses us as instruments to do that work. As the body of Christ, we are the hands and feet of Jesus. So when we minister and we do work, it's really not us, it's Jesus doing that work, but he chooses to use us as instruments. Isn't that cool? And you and I have that unique opportunity to be used by him. So this work of baptism that his disciples were performing was not the same as Christian baptism that we know about today that we've been celebrating so often these past few weekends. Christian baptism identifies us with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Obviously, this is before the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. So this was probably some form of the baptism of John, some sort of a baptism of repentance that these disciples were doing. So John the baptizer was also baptizing, but he was further north in the region near Samaria. And it's brought to his attention through some sort of a dispute between John's disciples and some unnamed Jewish person about this purification. And one of these people came to John and said, hey John, remember that guy that you told us about, Jesus? You know what him and his disciples are doing? They're baptizing. You know what else? Everyone, everyone, everybody <laughs> is going to him. Now, put yourself in John and his disciples' sandals for a moment. Like, baptism is their thing. He's John the baptizer, for crying out loud, right? That's kind of his gig. That's what he does. And he's been faithfully preaching repentance. He's been baptizing people for years. He's probably the first person to do this thing called baptism. He's the OG of baptism. This is what he does, right? And he's been gaining a following. Uh, scholars estimate that the crowds that would come to see the ministry of John the baptizer could have numbered in the hundreds of thousands. And then God incarnate, Jesus, shows up and starts doing the very thing that John had made a name for himself by doing. Like, don't you just think that at first he might have felt like he was being um, sidelined? or made unnecessary, or being replaced, or maybe he was now Mr. Irrelevant. You know, if we're just being gut level honest this morning, there are many times when this very sort of thing can happen to us in the Christian life. Like we don't mean for it to, but we, we find ourselves serving God, we find ourselves serving others in a very fruitful and rewarding and God honoring ministry and task and service and it brings a lot of life to us and we feel very fulfilled doing it and we don't mean for it to happen, but what slowly starts to happen is we start to find our identity in what we do for God and what we do for others. And what we are doing becomes so closely intertwined with who we are, we're not quite sure where one ends and where one begins. And we don't mean for it to happen, but we start to find our significance and our importance and our value in what we do for God and others instead of who we are in Christ. And then seasons change. And that thing that we were doing that we found so much value and significance in, that's not really needed anymore. And we don't know how to let that go because that feels like a part of us. Or God shuts the door or God takes us out of that situation. I've talked with parents before that have told me, man, I made my entire identity into being a mom or being a dad, and then those babies grew up and they left and we were empty nesters, and I'm like, if I'm not a mom, who am I? I've talked to missionaries before that said my entire life was built around this mission, and then God shut the door and I came off the field and I came home, and if I'm not a missionary, what am I anymore? And here's the thing, man, you're, you're not a human doing, you're a human being. Who you are first as a child of God if you are in Christ. You know, sometimes we think far too low of ourselves. We see ourselves as insignificant in the plan of God unless we're performing certain special tasks or responsibilities. Unless I'm leading this, I'm not important. Unless I'm on a platform, I'm not important. Unless I have a title, I'm not important. Unless I'm doing this, I'm not important. But that is so untrue. 
And all through the pages of scripture, God specializes in taking very ordinary, very insignificant vessels and doing mighty things through them. And other times we think far too highly of ourselves as if somehow God can't work to save anyone or God can't work to help anyone or God can't minister to anyone unless we're the person that's involved in that. But that's simply untrue, isn't it? Like, here's the reality, man. God doesn't need you. God doesn't need me. And so it's right for us to know first and foremost whose we are. We are not defined by what we do. We are not defined by what people say about us. We're not defined by the applause we get or the criticism we get. We are defined first and foremost by who we are in Jesus. And if we know who we are in Jesus, we can be grateful that God chooses to use us at all because he doesn't need us and that he chooses to use us anyway. And so John's disciples seem just a little bit bothered that the crowds are going to Jesus instead of to him. But John isn't bothered one bit by it. He says in verse 27, no one can receive anything unless it has been given to him from heaven. He understands that everything he had, including everyone who had responded to his ministry, his disciples, the multitudes of people who were listening to all of that was a gift from God. And it was a temporary gift from God. But John was just grateful for that opportunity and that unique task that God had called him to that was for a short amount of time because he understood who he was and he understood who Jesus was. Man, my prayer is for us to be a generation of Christians that know who we are and we know who Jesus is and we know the difference between the two because we are cursed right now in the American church with a cult of celebrity. We have elevated men and women to places that is so improper and so inappropriate and so devastating to the spiritual health of the church in this nation. And then we wonder why churches are collapsing and ministers are falling and letting us down left and right. Listen, it's because there is a difference between who we are and who Jesus is. We are not the Messiah. Jesus is. You are not the Messiah for your family. You are not the Messiah for your workplace. You are not the Messiah for this church. Your job is to simply point others away from you to the Messiah. And John understood that. And he starts using the language of a wedding. He says in verse 29, he who has the bride is the groom, but the groom's friend who stands by and listens for him rejoices greatly at the groom's voice. My brother was the best man at my wedding. And any time I've officiated a wedding, um, usually there's a best man, but nobody goes to a wedding to see the best man, do they? Like the wedding, the whole point of the wedding is for the bridegroom and the bride to come together. And when the ceremony starts, you see the bride at the end of the aisle and she's locking eyes with the groom and everybody's looking between the groom and the bride and they're going, is the groom gonna cry? I hope he cries, right? And that's the best part, right? And he's sitting there watching her trying not to cry, right? And then and she's walking down the aisle. Everybody's, we're just transfixed in that moment, right? As bride and groom are coming together. I want you to imagine how wildly tacky and inappropriate that would be if in the midst of that, the best man jumped out and said, I could do a hundred push-ups in four minutes. You, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> yeah, like, um, <laughs> not only would you start laughing, you, you'd probably go, man, that guy's mentally unwell or drunk. <laughs> because not only is that incredibly tacky, that's incredibly inappropriate, right? Because the whole point is not the best man. The whole point is in the bride and the groom coming together. And John says, this is the point of it all, that the bride comes together with the bridegroom. Who's the bride? The people of God, we are. And so our heart should be to see the people of God fall in love with the lover of their soul. And that's Jesus, not you, not me. We're, we're just the best man at the wedding. We're not the bridegroom. And John understands this and he says, he must increase. Jesus must increase. I must decrease. It was good for John to become less visible. It was good for John to become less known so that Jesus could become more visible and Jesus could become more known. 
Let me ask you a question. Can you say that? Is it important for you to be visible and known and seen and applauded and noticed? Do you get offended when you're not recognized? Do you get offended when people don't say thank you for something that you did? Or people don't recognize your contribution to a certain thing? If you're offended by that and your, your pride is hurt by that, can I ask you a question? Why is that? Could, could it be that for some of us, we're trying to find our significance in what we do for Jesus instead of finding our value in who we are in Jesus? My prayer for all of us is that it's just enough for us to know that in our lives, people are seeing and knowing Jesus better, even if that means they're not seeing us. Let's keep going. Look, if you will, in the next part. Look, if you will, at verse 31. Let's read from verse 31 to verse 33. The one who comes from above is above all. The one who comes from the earth is earthly and speaks in earthly terms. The one who comes from heaven is above all. He testifies to what he has seen and heard, and yet no one accepts his testimony. The one who has accepted his testimony has affirmed that God is true. So scholars are a little bit divided as to who it is that's speaking from verse 31 to 36. Some think that maybe it's John the Baptist still speaking. Others say, no, this is now John the Apostle who has kind of given a mini sermonette. Um, either way, we're, we're given this very strong presentation of who Jesus is, what he's come to do, and the truth to which Jesus testifies. One of the things we see from the very beginning of this passage is that Jesus wasn't just an exceptionally spiritual or an exceptionally wise man or a good man. Jesus was God, Jesus is God, and Jesus will always be God. Because John says he is the one who came from above and he is above all. So every human being, including John the baptizer, is from the earth and belongs to the earth. But Jesus' origin is heavenly, and so therefore he is eternal. He has always existed, and he will always exist. Therefore, he is above all. Here's another way of looking at it. He is the only uncreated being in the entire universe. If you're like, wow, how did God get a beginning? He didn't have to have a beginning, because he's God. So, since Jesus came from heaven, he represents God the Father. So to reject the testimony and the words of Jesus is to reject God. Jesus said this in John 5. So that means that we can trust that the testimony of Jesus is true. Everything Jesus spoke to us can be trusted. Why? Because Jesus is the true God who testifies to what he has seen. Because Jesus came from heaven and because Jesus is above all, what he shared about what he had seen and what he'd heard from the Father is trustworthy. This is what many people said about the teaching of Jesus. They said he teaches as one with authority and not like the scribes. Jesus, when he taught, did not rely on secondhand knowledge. Everything Jesus spoke was firsthand knowledge. He didn't need anybody to tell him anything about the reality of who God was because Jesus himself is God and Jesus is in perfect communion with God the Father and speaks what God the Father spoke to him. So what does that mean for me and you? Well, here's what it means. We can trust everything Jesus said. So everything he said about life, about death, about heaven, about hell, about how to live, about the end of all things is trustworthy because Jesus testifies to what he has seen. And yet, here's what John said is the irony of all ironies, yet no one accepts his testimony. For 400 years, the people of Israel had been waiting for a revelation from God and for the coming of the promised prophet. If you look in your Bible at the book of Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament, to the book of Matthew, that represents a kind of a 400 year period of silence. And then God shows up on the scene. God himself shows up on the scene. And yet, his own people did not recognize him. His own people did not respond and accept his testimony as true. And you know, the same is true today that there are so many that do not accept the testimony of Jesus to be true. And some of us go, well, because it isn't popular, I guess it can't be true. But you know, there's been a lot of trends in the world that people have believed simply because they were popular. And just because something's popular doesn't mean it's true or untrue. 
right? Like Jesus affirmed this truth. He said, small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life and only few find it. And so if we're waiting for Christianity to become the popular thing before we jump in, we just gotta remember that Jesus said the road is very narrow. The broad road, that's the one that leads to destruction. You don't wanna be on the broad road. You wanna be on the narrow road of eternal life. And the one who has accepted his testimony, that's the testimony of Jesus, has affirmed that God is true. Now that's a fascinating idea because here's what John is saying. If you receive the words of Jesus as true, and you put them into practice in your life, something will then happen. You will then start to see God's truth and experience God's power firsthand. But you have to first accept that testimony is true. You know, many of us say, hey, if I just see, then I'll believe. If I just see enough proof, if I see enough evidence, if Jesus shows up in my toast one morning, then I'll believe, right? So God, do a magic trick. God, show me enough proof. And then if you show me enough proof, then I'll believe. And, and what we read in the Gospel of John is actually quite the opposite. If we believe first, then we'll see. Then we'll affirm that God is true. That when we receive the truth of Jesus, we begin to experience the power and begin to experience the truth of everything that God has. And man, we could share story after story after testimony after testimony of how that's worked in the lives of so many in this room. I could just testify to this. Um, man, I went through a season a couple of years where I was just quite um, uncertain about the claims of scripture. I was just kind of like, man, I don't know. And I had this one moment where I sat down with my Bible and I just said, I'm just gonna read this as if it's true. I'm not gonna argue with it. I'm not gonna try to import anything I've been taught about it. I'm just gonna read it at face value. And man, as I received it as truth, the testimony of Jesus, something happened in my life. I started to be changed. But what happened is that I had to believe first before I saw that change. And this is what we're gonna see over and over through the Gospel of John, that believing is seeing. Let's keep going. Look, if you will, at this last part, verse 34 to 36. For the one whom God sent speaks God's words. Since he gives the Spirit without measure... The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hands. The one who believes in the Son has eternal life, but the one who rejects the Son will not see life. Instead, the wrath of God remains on him. Many people um, like to combat the teachings of the Bible they don't like by trying to find out if that's in the Old Testament And if that's a teaching they don't like, here's something I hear many people say. Well, that's Old Testament God. You hear people say this, right? An Old Testament God is cranky and he needs a nap and he's mad all the time, right? I believe in Jesus. Jesus is wearing Chacos and a man bun and he likes herbal tea. (laughs) And he's a cool, chill dude. But I need to let you in on a little secret. Jesus is Old Testament God. And he didn't come to deliver his own message. He came to speak the very words of Old Testament God. And Old Testament God and New Testament God are the exact same God. So in a sense, Jesus came as the ultimate and greatest prophet. Prophets in the Old Testament were sent by God to speak the word of God and the spirit of God would fill them in such a way that they were given just the right measure of power for just the amount of time to fulfill their prophetic task and their prophetic burden. But John says Jesus was given the spirit of God without measure. And so everything that Jesus spoke was not his own message to speak, it was the very words of God. And that Jesus is God, the Father's beloved Son. And so because the Father loves the Son, he has given him all things. That means Jesus has authority over life and over death and over forgiveness and over punishment and over salvation and over condemnation. That Jesus has the power and the authority to give eternal life to whoever he wishes to. And this is what John says, that Jesus has chosen to give eternal life to those who believe in the Son. So the word believe in verse 36 is not contrasted with the word disbelieve. Interestingly enough, it is contrasted with the word reject. And so here's what we need to understand about that. 
to believe means more than just to have an intellectual assent into something. Are you following me with that? To believe in Jesus is more than just you believing he existed and you believing some facts about him and you knowing that he is the answer. To believe in him is for you to be allegiant and to be loyal to, for you to trust in him, for you to cling to him, for you to give all of yourself to him. But to reject him is to disobey him, to rebel against him, to be disloyal to him or to, to refuse him. See, the testimony and the work and the identity of Jesus require from us as human beings an active response. We can't just sit on the fence and be unmoved. To sit on the fence and be unmoved is, by default, to reject him. And the response Jesus says that we must give him is to believe in him. By being loyal to him and allegiant to him and obeying him. And when we do that, the gift that we are promised is the gift of eternal life. Now, Eternal life doesn't just mean that we go to heaven when we die, although that is true. And how many of you are looking forward to that? And the fact that we don't have to live afraid of death? That for us as believers, to, to live as Christ and to die as gain? That man, death for us is a doorway into a greater and more fulfilling type of existence because we're with the Lord and all the pain and suffering of this life is no more. And for those who have gone before us in Christ, they're waiting for us. And so death for us is a homecoming and a reunion. And that's amazing, isn't it? And we look forward to that. We take comfort in that. But it is so much more than that. The offer that Jesus has extended to us is that he will give eternal life that begins now when we choose to believe in him. When I say the word eternal life, some of your minds go to Tom and Jerry heaven. You think of fat babies sitting on clouds and diapers playing harps, and you think that's heaven. You're like, well, that sounds really boring, but I guess it's better than roasting in hell. But eternal life, according to the scripture, is so much more than that. It is the state of being spiritually alive because the very life of God begins to dwell inside of your being through the Holy Spirit. And that life begins when you put faith in Jesus, but that is a life that will continue forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And if you believe in the Son, you have eternal life, but if you reject the Son, you will not see that life. To reject mean, Jesus means to disobey him, to rebel against him, to, to be disloyal to him, or just to flat out refuse him. And here's the saddest irony of all that there are many people who claim a saving faith in Jesus all the while they reject him at the same time by not obeying his word. Jesus would say, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but you don't obey my commands? You know, I don't, I don't care maybe what you've been taught when you grew up. According to the scriptures, what we believe and how we live, those things are intertwined. You can't separate them. You can't say, I want Jesus as my savior, but I don't care if he's my Lord. No, you'll either have all of them or you'll have none of them. We read in the book of James, faith without works is dead. So if you claim a saving faith in Jesus and yet you live any way you want, you disobey every single command you can, you don't have no desire in your heart to obey him or follow him, the trajectory of your life is that you are the king and the Lord of your life, not Jesus, and yet you say, I'm saved because I prayed a magic prayer when I was seven at youth camp so I can live any way I want. You, my friend, are deceived. Because listen, how we live and what we believe, they've gotta be connected. So if you haven't turned from your sin and you're not obeying Jesus now, you're still rejecting him. According to this passage, you, you will not see life. Instead, the wrath of God remains on you. And then that's a sobering, sobering, sobering truth. Listen, the opposite of eternal life is eternal death. An eternal death is the wrath of God, complete and utter and total separation from God. Now, some of us see that and go, well, that doesn't sound so bad, but I want you to think about this for a minute. The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. That means that like we all as human beings, because the presence of God is in some way here on the earth, we all experience these things called common grace. So every human gets to experience things like the sunset and a delicious meal and family and puppies and things like that, right? <laughs> like you don't have to be a born again believer to 
receive the presence of God in the gifts that God gives us. That's called common grace. But I want you to imagine an existence where all that is completely taken away because the presence of God has been taken away and you're separated from God. What you're left with is an existence of suffering, of pain, of regret, of darkness, of defilement, of despair. That gets worse and worse and worse and worse over time and yet it never ends. But ultimately you chose that because you chose separation from God because you wanted nothing to do with God in this life and so you will have nothing to do with God in the life to come. But you don't have to die and go to hell to be under the wrath of God. If you do not believe, according to Jesus in verse 18, you are condemned already. So the verdict has been given and yet the sentence has not been executed. You are guilty. And yet, you're still here, which means you have a chance to be forgiven. Hey, put your hand on your heart for a second. Take a deep breath. <sighs> Sorry, live stream team. They got onto me for breathing too loud earlier. Um, I love you guys. Hey, you feel your heartbeat? You know there's breath in your lungs right now, you know why? Because there's a God in heaven that gave you that gift of your next heartbeat and that gave you that gift of the breath in your lungs. And if you don't know Jesus the Son, he gave you that gift because he is patient and he's long suffering and he's calling you to repent because he loves you. He doesn't want you to suffer in everlasting separation from him. He wants to call you into his home as a son or a daughter. That's the kind of God we serve. He loves you so much he died for you. And so here's the question that matters. How will you respond? How will you respond? The cry of every true disciple's heart in response to the identity of Jesus should be what John the baptizer said, and that is he must increase and I must decrease. This is exceptionally difficult for people in our culture right now to grab hold of and to implement in our life because people in our world right now are constantly vying for attention. We're constantly vying for the spotlight. We are constantly looking for the chance to be known or be discovered. And man, there's so many reasons for this, but I think the big part of it is we just live with this hole in our hearts that can only be satisfied by our creator. But so often we buy into this lie that if other people are applauding me and other people are noticing me, then I will feel less empty and less insecure and take it from a guy who's gone down that road. No, you won't. You'll just feel more insecure and you'll feel more empty, but you will feel very, very unknown because people don't know the real you. They just know the version of you that you've created. No, you were created for a relationship with your God and King. And when you know whose you are, and when you know your identity in Christ, the desire of your heart can be to just be a friend of the bridegroom. And you just wanna see people fall in love with Jesus. You just wanna see people know Jesus. You wanna see people love Jesus. For you, it doesn't matter so much if they know and they love you, because that doesn't matter, because you know that you are known and you are loved by him. And so you want them to be known and you want them to be loved by him too. We have to ask ourselves this very sobering question. Do I find my significance through being known and seen? And if I do, man, what's that about? Why is that? It should be through who we are in Jesus. A response that makes sense is to understand that Christ is above all. There is a day that's coming when Jesus Christ will return to this earth and when he comes a second time, he's not coming back as a baby in a manger. He's coming back as the conquering king on a white horse with his name tattooed on his thigh and his garments stained in the blood of his enemies. And on that day, the scriptures say, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. Every cynic, every skeptic, every mocker, every person that has rejected him in this life will bow their knee and confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord. Here's the thing. In this world right now, so many mock him and so many reject him and so, when, so many are on the fence about, well, what is he, what is he not? Um, he's still Lord. It's just that not everyone accepts that testimony. Here's the question that matters. Do you accept that testimony? And before you answer yes, ask yourself, 
What about my lifestyle? Because I mean, you could put a bumper, a bumper sticker on your car that says Jesus is Lord, right? But that is not the question that matters. The question that matters is in your lifestyle, is he Lord above all things? And, and if you wanna know what your Lord is or who your Lord is, what do you have to consult first before you obey the Lord? What do you have to obey or follow first before you obey the Lord? If God spoke to you right now in a very real way and said, hey, I want you to serve, I want you to give, I want you to minister to that person, but the first thought in your mind was, yeah, but there's a game on this afternoon. I think we just found who's Lord in your life. And it's not the king of all kings, it's your entertainment and your addiction to comfort and convenience. A response that makes sense is to understand just how much we've been given through this gift of eternal life. But God's offer is not just to give you a golden ticket to heaven when you die and you can live any way you want, but because you got that lucky rabbit's foot on your keychain because you prayed that prayer once upon a time, you can live any way you want and still go to heaven. No, his gift is that the very life of God would be placed inside of you through the Holy Spirit. And when the very life of almighty creator God gets placed inside you, you will change. You will never be the same. He will recreate you into a new kind of creature and that's what he's offering you. And that begins when you place your faith in Christ and that continues on and on and on and on. But if you reject Jesus through disobedience, through apathy, and through rebellion, the promise that we've received from his word this morning is we won't see that life. Instead, we will remain under the wrath of God. And some of us, we don't feel like we're under the wrath of God because we're like, man, life is pretty good. But no, you're guilty. Just the sentence hasn't been carried out yet. And every day you have now is a gift and a chance for you to repent and receive his grace. But I wanna submit to you that that way of living is not living at all because there's a difference between just being alive and really living. You ever been in a season where you just feel like you're existing? You're just kind of sleepwalking, you're just kind of going through the motions and you don't feel like you're alive? But Jesus is gonna tell us in John's gospel that he came that we might have life and life to its fullest. And life and life to its fullest is when we have an enduring state of inner peace because we are abiding in Christ, we have a relationship with God the Father, and we're being filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's the only way we can truly be alive. And lastly, the response that makes sense when we know the person of Jesus is just to believe. And when we believe, we will see amazing things. Some of us are on the fence because we say, well, I just need to see proof. I wanna study and admire the words of Jesus and analyze it, I need this, I need that, and there's, some aspects of that we're gonna read about. There's uh, Thomas, you remember him? Doubting Thomas, we're kind of mean, we give him a mean nickname. And he says, I need to see proof. And Jesus shows up and he goes, hey, here's the, the holes in my hand, here's my side. Thomas, do you see, you believe, you got your proof? And then Jesus says, blessed is the one who has not seen and yet believed. But for some of us, no amount of proof is gonna be enough for us because it's not a matter of us needing proof. It's a matter of our stubborn hearts simply not wanting to believe God no matter how much proof we receive. When we take that step of faith and we put our hope and trust in Jesus, even in the midst of our questions, something miraculous happens. We begin to experience the truth and the power of God like never before in our lives. But first, we gotta step out in faith. That means letting go of our sin. Do you know repentance is an act of faith? Here's what repentance says. Jesus, I believe that your version of life is more fulfilling and better than me choosing to remain in my version of life. I believe that your version of sobriety and not being drunk is actually better and more fulfilling long-term than going out and getting drunk every Friday night. Jesus, I believe that your version of life when it comes to sexual purity is more fulfilling and satisfying and better for me than my own version of what sexual fulfillment looks like. It's an act of faith. You coming into agreement with what God says about sin and you choosing to let go of whatever God says about sin is an act of faith. And listen, you may not feel it at all at first, but if you believe him and come into agreement with him, you will see power at work in your life or you can affirm the truth of God for you to believe in him and to receive him into your life in obedient and trusting faith. 
And when you do that, he starts to show up and he meets you in that place. You start to see his power. You start to see his truth. You start to experience peace like never before. The Bible says it is peace that surpasses all understanding. Or you don't even understand why you have the peace that you do. But where does that start? Belief. And if you believe, you'll see. Can we pray together this morning?